Hi everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa, and I am on my sofa today. It is actually morning time, I'm sitting here with the dogs, we're all cuddly wuddly on the sofa, having my morning coffee, and I hope y'all are doing well. And as you see from the title of the video, we are going to be continuing to discuss the Tim Jones Jr. saga. And... Uh, today, I'm going to be talking specifically about Sergeant Creech's testimony. Uh, I made, <clears throat> pardon me, I made some little notes and whatnot in there, and I've kind of split them into two different categories, one being recorded statements and one being non-recorded statements, uh, because the two biggest things that jumped out to me in his testimony was having to listen to that, um, the recording of the ride home after they took Tim Jones Jr., to point out the where his children were. And so that recording that they were playing in court, the open courtroom. Um, and then also after that was some of the uh, unrecorded, because apparently there was like kind of back and forth with recording, non-recording, and so they went over some stuff that was talked about that wasn't on tape. Uh, and so there's just some things that I was like, oh my gosh. So basically what I've done is I've made like a little list here just to kind of go down. And I just kind of want to go through those and talk with you about them. Um, and first and foremost, you know, if you were in the live chat last night, we did, we talked about some of this a little bit. Um, but can we just talk for a second about the audio uh, quality of this trial? I mean, my goodness, it is so frustrating to listen to. Um, it just, you know, you're just like, oh my God, one second they're blasting your ears out, the other you can't understand what they say. So, I mean, it is what it is, but it just makes it difficult when you're trying to sit here and hang on every word that they're saying. Anyways, let's go ahead and get started here. So, as we know, again, this is about Sergeant Creech, and he is in the, he oversees a special victims unit. And we're going to first talk about the ride home after, you know, Tim Jones Jr., points out where his children are. And so, the, I, again, I just made these little statements, so I'm just going to go down them. Uh, I know I'm prosecuting myself, but I want to do the right thing. So we see this a lot with him and other people that I consider to be kind of narcissistic-type personalities. And he's almost trying to say in here, like, well, I, I know, you know, I've got one on you. I know what I'm doing, but I'm doing y'all a favor. Like, look, I'm a good guy here. Yeah, I'm doing the right thing. I'm prosecuting myself, but, you know, I, I'm still a good guy. I'm still a decent person. Um, and that is one thing that we see towards the end of Creech's um, testimony is the uh, the state basically asking him, you know, is it important that he feels like you like him? And this is very, you know, public opinion. And we'll get to some of the public opinion type comments that uh, Jones made because I was just like, what? Um, Let's see. And Creech just say he becomes very emotional when they pull down the road where the bodies are and hysterical when he points out, uh, they're over there. Um openly talks about how he openly sobs and then comes to a stop, which we see this in court. And again, it's his affect is very odd. And again, we've seen other cases like this where people don't kind of act the way or their facial expressions, you know, their affect. I mean, just the way they talk about things comes off as odd. Let's talk about, you know, Jeffrey McDonald and his uh, interview that he did when he was allegedly, you know, got off the crime and he went to that talk show. I can't remember the name of the talk show host right now. Uh, but he did that, and that was the first thing. They were just like, he, his affect was completely off. Like, he did not sound like a man whose family was slaughtered. So uh, this is what happens here, too, with Jones, and we see this a lot with other people. So it's interesting to have someone that we know they are not trying to say they did not kill their children. Uh, we know for a fact that he did. It's just, you know, you know, was he sane or not? But here we have someone we know they did it. It's not a question if they did it or not. And we can analyze their behavior from there because he does sit there and when he cries in court, he cries at odd times to me and he'll immediately stop. You know, just come to a complete halt and his face goes right back to that resting position. And Creech even discusses that where he's, he talks later where he was like, uh, something was taking place and he just came to a complete halt from sobbing and was like, let's cut to the chase. You know, and he, it was just this, you know, 360 all of a sudden. So, um... Moving on, another comment. Even though I knew what I would lose, I had to turn myself in and get it off my chest. How can people do something like that and not tell? So, and the computer goes blank. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so that right there, again, it's like he's trying to, you know, find these ways to 
distance himself from the situation um, to make it, I'm still a good guy. Look, I'm not the same as this person that did this over here. Um, I, I told him myself, so I'm decent, you know, but a truly awful person would do this over here. And I think that that, I mean, this is obviously an extreme, but I think that that is human nature. I think this is why we see a lot of, you know, gossip. We see lots of, you know, just stuff like that out in the world because people, people feel better about themselves when they have somebody else to put beneath them. And I'm not saying everybody does this. Um, Bailey clearly has opinions of this too. Uh, I'm not trying to say that everybody does this, but it is, I mean, this is a thing. And so we're seeing this here where he continually tries to come back at, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing this, so I'm good. Or oh, these people over here aren't good because they did this. You know, this hierarchy and what crime is better than the other. Um, which is just, you know, okay. Um, you know, I just made this quick note, but at some point during this, they were asking him, like, well, you knew there was going to be more questions once we found the bodies, and he used the word dead assumption. Well, I knew it was a dead assumption. I mean, I hate to, I hate to say it like that, but it's, again, I'm like, why would you say it? I mean, maybe that's the way, the way he talks, or that's a thing for him, but it's just, again, one of those things that, you know, such an odd thing to say, to use in that moment. I would go out of my way not to use the word dead. <laughs> and if that was a scenario. Um, okay, then he, this here too. Well, I wasn't exactly merciless when I threw them out there. I just wanted to get out of there. So again, he's trying to, he knows it was horrific. And so to me, it sounds like he just grabbed them like garbage and threw them in the woods. You know, or whatever. I mean, he wasn't, you know, trying to show any care or anything like this with them. So again, he's trying to create this, look, I'm still a good person, but I just want you to know. And we kind of saw this with the Chris Watts thing. Because remember how in Watts, they took a long time. Like he did not want to come out and say, I threw one around the world, girl. You know, type situation. I mean, it was like pulling. They had to really get him to walk around a thing because it does i mean it's horrible you know what i mean like you th you threw them away uh you know so anyways let's continue um i tried to make sure there was as little suffering as possible you know okay again i you know i wasn't completely horrible you know i tried to kill them quickly and as we heard in testimony and other cases and stuff i mean a strangulation death is not like super quick i mean it's not like a bullet to the head um, it's not any of those things. I mean, it's, you know, now I don't know how it differs for a little child. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, so nonetheless, to me, it's also a very personal way of killing somebody. I mean, when you're using hands or even a belt, whatever, um, but this whole statement of, you know, I wanted to make sure there's as little suffering as possible and, you know, okay, thanks. Um, so then this right here too. Uh, I couldn't bring myself to mutilate them. Started with Nathan because he was the focal point of the whole thing. Now, this is another thing that we continually see throughout the whole thing is that Nathan was the focal point. Nathan was the focal point. He had this thing against this child, and this child set him off point blank period and it just it comes through in all of his stuff you know i always say this i say this all my things people tell you everything you need to know in between their words so he's not only telling us in his words but if you just listen to in between things you know everything just always comes back to nathan and later on in here um they say the detective is saying that pardon me um what was it that Nathan? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I've been calling him Nathan. Natan, Natan, Natan. Um, I wrote it down wrong, so it is Natan. I apologize. Um, the detective saying later on. So later on, the detective is saying with Natan that uh, something about the glasses being broken that you could tell he was still bitter over that. You could hear it in his voice. You know that he was still angry over this, and that's what I'm talking about with saying what what we need to say in between words or vocal points, not exactly the words. So someone can sit here and say I'm sorry all day long, but when you're still upset over a child that you murdered, you know breaking some glasses. After five years later, whatever, however long this was, doesn't even matter. I mean, that's telling you all you need to know. There was this fixation on a ton. Um, and I'm going to say his name right from now on out. I apologize. I hate that. Um, I'm going to move on down the list. So, uh, again, the thing about the socket and this premeditation against him. And one thing that I think is taking place here, and 
again, y'all drop it like it's hot down in the comment section if you have more info on this, is I definitely think that the socket thing is true. I think something was going on with the socket. Whatever Natan did, he could have accidentally tripped the breaker. I don't know, but it set him off. And the fact that Amber was able to calm Natan down or get the information from Natan very quickly. And the defense lawyer brings this up where he's like, you know, here, you know, is all this animosity with uh, Amber. And she's able to get on the phone and get this information out of Natan when he's tried for hours to do it, which is simply, I didn't mean to do it, whatever it was. So that being said, there's also this whole thing about this, the kids are out to get me and da da da, da which I think it more aligns itself with something with DSS, him thinking the kids are intentionally trying to throw him under the bus with DSS because DSS is breathing down their necks. And so I almost think that his main concern isn't, oh gosh, you could have hurt yourself, Natan, or this, that, or the other. It's you're trying to mess with me and DSS and essentially get to go back to your mother's, which is something that he seemingly does not want to have happen. And I just think that's very interesting. So I'm curious to see what y'all think about that. Um, okay, I'm going to continue on. Now, some of these things are in relation to the guilt that he displays. So like the officer in this, he's like, have we treated you fair throughout this investigation? And he's like, yeah, this is my fault. It's something I did. I was one that made a bad choice. Um, another comment was they were talking about transferring jails and he's like, we'll be more comfortable at this one. I don't deserve comfort. You know, he admits numerous times of being remorseful. Um, now when he gets into things about like, Oh, the voices said, the voices said, the voices said things like cut them up and feed them to a hog, throw them in some concrete, burn the bodies. I mean, really the whole thing about voices I'm just like this. We have voices going through. I said this in other videos. I'll keep saying it. Uh, we have voices that go through our head all day long. It's called that inner voice. I think we all have that. If you don't, please correct me. Um, there's a difference between a voice telling you to cut your child up and feed him to a hog out of the blue and you thinking a person's there telling you, and I don't know what it's like to hear those kind of voices, and an afterthought of how do I cover this up and get rid of that. Oh, maybe I cut him up and feed him to a hog. I mean, that's what he's talking about, but he's trying to make it sound like a voice. I don't think these officers believe a word he's saying in that level. I think they know that he is completely narcissistic. I think, obviously, he does have some mental issues going on, but I don't think it's to the level of him not being responsible for what he did, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so now let's get into this part. So this is one of those... You know, in fact, let me take a sip of coffee first because this one just, like, blew my mind when I heard this. Could you contact that paper in South Carolina, the mugshots paper, and make sure they don't print my mugshot in that? I mean, I was just like, are you kidding me? You're honestly thinking that. And what was funny to me, because I know the paper, I've seen them at gas stations and stuff, and I guess it's called mugshots, and they put mugshots in there. And I'm like... He's not even thinking. I'm like, dude, this is like front page news. Like, this is past mugshots. You know, and he is, and I mean, again, if you're in the midst of, you're behind the scenes and you've done the crime, of course that's going to be a normal thought of, oh my God, this is going to blow up. This is going to be everywhere. I mean, it, that's, again, another one of those things that make me say, well, he's completely in his right mind. That's a totally normal thought to have. You know, to be embarrassed of what you've done, ashamed. Oh my gosh, it's going to go out there. But for it to also just go down to that level of, I don't want my thing in mugshot. I'm like, honey, you're going to be all over the news. Like, forget mug shots. Like, that's, you know, that that's small fish right there. Um, so that part just, you know, and again, it just goes to that narcissistic behavior of like, really? Like, that's your thought process? So let's go to some non-recorded statements and just some general stuff that I heard them say. So again, another thing in the unrecorded aspect that Sergeant Creech talks about is him saying stuff about uh, people that can murder someone without entering a more scare me and him asking him, do they scare you? And I don't know why you would even ask that or why you want to make it look like I have remorse. Because he's almost going with these two. I think he's trying to show that he's remorseful because, I mean, we would hope that he would be. I would like to assign that human trait to him. Um, but I don't think he's remorseful for the right reasons. I don't think he's, re I think he's remorseful because his life is over. Um... 
Okay, so there's that next thing. So they're talking about a little timeline. So they say the defense, the state prosecutor is talking about Tim kills Natan and then downloads American History X, then kills the kids a bit later. So there's like this time, like a couple hour time jump. So and the the thing that he watched was uh, a very brutal scene uh, between. I don't want to say what it is, um, but it takes place between two men and the showers, and it's in jail. You can do the math on that, and it's brutal and it's not pretty. I've not seen it. So, um, I, I mean, maybe I should go watch it and see what it's about. But, I mean, to me, I'm almost like, okay, so he flips out. He does this thing with Natan. Then, for whatever reason, he watches this. And it seemingly looks like he gets scared. Like, oh, God, that's going to happen to me. Uh, so, my answer is to wipe out the whole family. So, I think here is where... Because didn't remember, and I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, where he said that one of the girls walked in on this happening. I mean, I think it's one of those scenarios, very similar to kind of the Watts thing, where, you know, maybe one of the kids walked in while the act was taking place, and it was like, well, now everybody has to go, or, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, this, you know, we can debate this left and right all, the, all day long. So, anyways, but that whole part right there where I'm just like, really? That, I mean, again, it just floors me. Um, So, let's see... The, the state goes through all the lies that Jones told, you know, from the kids saying, uh, what was it, uh, letting them out at Walmart, the kids having, that the, he was afraid of the kids, and, you know, all this stuff, and didn't have any kids, to, you know, oh, well, now I have three kids, or whatever. I mean, he just lied continually. Um, and then he, like, came up with these exaggerated lies about what the stuff from Walmart was. And so the picture that they showed him leaving Walmart, I mean, that's so spooky. You know, because it's like, here he's walking out with death tools. Um, so... Let's see. I already talked about that. The Scooby Snacks. Scooby Dooby Doo. Where are you? Um, the fact that they're called Scooby Snacks, I can't get past. But, you know, it says that he didn't take Scooby Snacks before he killed them, only after. Um, refers to the kids as evidence. Uh, th we already talked about you know, him getting noticeably angry over into Tom breaking glasses. And now we're going to end this video with this one because this is the big, a big whammy. The whole thing's a big whammy, let's be honest. But this one really takes the cake. And this is talking about being on Suicide Watch and he's basically like, I would never kill myself because that's like a cardinal sin and I believe that you would go straight to hell over that. So he believes that he can be forgiven for the sense of killing his family but not suicide. And that's just where I get, and I don't want to sit here and criticize religious beliefs or anything like that, but this is the kind of thinking that I'm like, what? Like, how would you even, and I, again, I, I think that any human being has to justify things, and so even for an act like this, there has to be some justification of, oh, well, you know, it's not as bad as this, or not as bad as that. And I think some of that's going on there, because I can't wrap my mind around him honestly believing that. I'm like, you really think that that, really? Um, it just blows my mind. And again, almost like this, like, oh, well, no, I could never do that. You know, that's beneath, you know, that's horrible, but I mean, killing my children, that's fine. You know, it's kind of how I interpret it, a lot of it. So, anyways, this video is turning out way long. I hope you're still with me. Uh, if you are, I appreciate it. If you like my viewpoint and like hanging out with me, you can subscribe and come hang out all you want. Um, and other than that, I hope you all have a great day. I will talk to you all soon. I love you guys, and bye.